Good morning and um, welcome to a um, presentation uh, from Zimmer and Peacock on electrochemistry, um, bioelectrochemistry and biosensors. So I'm very much hoping that this live streaming is obviously going to sort of stream you all, uh, stream to YouTube for you all. So let me just give you a quick um, introduction to what we're going to talk about today. So what we're going to talk about today is um, so we were going to have some opening remarks from Hasim, but um, Hasim's actually mentioned to me that we've got so much material to discuss today that in fact we're not going to um, have an introduction from Hasim, but we will be doing a quite a large um, presentation, let's say. Um, on biosensors and bioelectric chemistry. We'll be doing some questions and answers. So at the end of this, um, there will be a, um, an opportunity to put some comments in the chat to see we'll look at them. And then you'll be able to um, ask some questions. We'll try to answer those. And then maybe some closing remarks from the scene. Um, so I'll do a quick introduction. Um, my name is, well, I'll have a slide on a quick introduction as to who I am. Um, a quick introduction to electrochemistry, a quick introduction to electroanalytical chemistry. Then we're going to talk about some, some techniques of electroanalytical chemistry, cyclovoltammetry, potentiometry, and amperometry. And then we're going to bring it all back to biosensors themselves. So in all, we're here to talk about biosensors. But in order to get to kind of have an understanding of biosensors, we have to have an understanding of um, chemistry, we have to have an understanding then of electroanalytical technique. And the key words here would be um, cyclovoltammetry, um, potentiometry, and amperometry. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dwell on this slide particularly, but if you wanna if you wanna contact us, you can find us on LinkedIn, you can find us on ResearchGate, you can find us on the website. Um, so there's plenty of places to kind of find us. We have strong affiliations with USN in Norway, um, University of Swansea in um, the UK, and also the University of Oxford in the UK as well. Uh, but yeah, you can find us on places like LinkedIn, and we're also on ResearchGate if you wanna kind of contact us. Zimmer and got we're just going to be very quick because we've only got a certain number of minutes. So just very quickly, we were formed in 2014. We have locations in the USA, UK, Norway, and we're very strong in Indonesia. We have products and we have services. You can find this on our website, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Now, what I'm going to do is... Uh, it's probably, it's probably worth saying the nice thing about electrochemistry and biosensors is that she makes her very happy um, people. So this is some photographs from around the business. We have um, obviously labs in the business. We have clean rooms in the business. We have manufacturing facilities in the business. And I think you know, because we're doing biosensors, um, it's a very you know, it's very interesting work. So I think we're you know there's a lot there's a there's a lot of energy in that in, in the business. A lot of people do want to work with us at Zimmer and Peacock, um, and it's super useful if you want to work with us if we actually already know you. So I just want to kind of put up, there's a few opportunities if people want to really come and you know, eventually maybe get a career with Zimmer and Peacock. There's one way we're into us, and that's actually, um, there's a Marie Curie postdoc call out there at the moment. So I put a, a, a link here to hopefully um, you can find that link. That 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 what that will allow you to do is actually come to our labs and do a postdoc project with us. What it does allow us to do is actually to kind of basically have an extended time with you, so we can actually know who you are and find out a bit more about you. Um, it's also probably worth knowing that we have a system called ZP Cell, so we do a lot work with a lot of entrepreneurial scientists around the globe. We work with them basically in a kind of commercial capacity. You know, we want to. You know, we're looking for entrepreneurs around the globe. So if you think you are an entrepreneur and a, and a business guy and you want to be a business guy, um, then it's worth contacting us. We are here to talk about biosensors. If you want to make a biosensor, you probably have you probably have to be familiar with with at least some of the following. You have to 
if you've got a background in MEMS, that's great. If you've got a background in thick film printing, that's useful. If you've got a background in digital printing, um, that's basically sort of robotic pipetting, that's super useful. Electronics is very important for biosensors. Mechanical engineering is very important for um, biosensing. We also do app development, so iOS development is useful. These days, if you're in biosensing, then um, cloud, the, the cloud and the cloud databases is kind of critical. Obviously, we're very interested in biosensor manufacturing. It's probably just worth me mentioning, actually, on biosensor manufacturing. I know that there'll, some, there'll be some people watching today who are in um, Southeast Asia. Um, I just saw on a press release last night that um, Dexcom, which is one of the biggest continuous glucose manufacturers, CGM, is just opening up a production facility in um, Malaysia. But as a repeat, we do biosensor manufacturing. Um, um, we also do microfluidics. We also do IP developments, and we also do a lot of um, AI, artificial intelligence um, work as well. Biosensing can mean things from the blood to urine. We also do biosensing um, in food as well. Right, let's get into the meat of this now. So we're here to talk initially about electrochemistry. So electrochemistry is really the study of um, the flow of electrons due to chemical and um, biological reactions. So electrochemistry is very important in the study of corrosion. Electrochemistry is very important in the um, in things like battery technology. So battery technology a few years ago, or 10, 15 years ago, was actually a very old industry, a very, I wouldn't want to say boring, but it, it wasn't changing very much. But then with um, Tesla and the electric cars and portable devices, battery technology is really thriving these days. Um, so electrochemistry is very important to see in people are making batteries, um, et cetera. Um, we also apply, um, there's another branch of electrochemistry, which is electroanalysis. So at Zimmer Peacock, we're really electroanalytical chemists, but we then apply those electroanalytical techniques um, into um, biosensors. And then uh, and another um, arm of electrochemistry is electrolysis, real quick. Um, yeah, is 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 um, electrolysis. I can hear a little bit of tapping, but it's okay. Um, so what I'll do is, um, so these are these are the kind of areas that electrochemistry can be applied into. Now, here I say, you know, what is electrochemistry from from the, from the perspective of an electrochemical biosensor? So really, an electrochemical biosensor is, or biosensing, is the relationship between something like a voltage, a current, a resistance, or capacitance, and a change in, um, or a change in a chemical or biological event. For example, you can make a COVID-19 electrochemical sensor, and you have a change in the resistance of a electrode due to the binding of the COVID-19 virus, as an example. So electrochemistry is the elect well, is the electrochemical is, is the electrical way of measuring chemical and biological events, um, and we use it in order to sense. Now, once upon a time, electrochemistry was actually done on instruments that were really quite large. You know, so he, this is the instrument itself. This is the laptop. So you know, the instrument itself was you know, obviously larger than the laptop. Um, and then you would have a, you know, wires coming to a glass cell, and in that glass cell, then there would be the, a solution, some 10 milliliters maybe of solution, and you'd have these big chunky electrodes pointing down into the solution. So that's the that was a way that electrochemistry was done. Now, if you if you were into biosensors. Um, and you enter a lab and they're also doing biosensor development and they're developing on instruments like this, then you must immediately kind of, you know, sort of, I mean, the, the way, the way, you know, the kind of instruments that we like to develop on, um, you know, are, are very small instruments. This is the beauty of electrochemistry and this is the beauty of doing biosensor development. But the scientific instruments in order to do, or, or in order to perform electrochemical chemical experiments or biosensing applications are very small. So I just want to give you a sense that once upon a time, you know, 
an electrochemical setup was was bench top. It's worth saying that this electrochemical setup is actually smaller than my phone. So it gives you a sense of actual, you know, scale. And that's a, that's one of the beauties of doing biosensor development or biosensor research. The instruments are actually quite competitively priced. And the sheer space that you need in order to do these kind of experiments is actually very small. Now, I've got a, I've got a picture here, and, and for scale, I'm going to sort of hold up an electrode so you get a sense of this is what I'm talking about. Um, you know, this is, I would call it, it's a screen printed electrode, but it's also an electrochemical cell. And what I mean by that is it has three zones on it which are a counter electrode, a working electrode, and a reference electrode. So when you look at this picture, there's the working electrode in the middle, there's a counter electrode around the edge, and there's a reference electrode here. So everything you need in order to sort of do the chemistry part of electrochemical analysis is in this within this circle. So this circle is now the modern equivalent of what used to be um, a glass vessel with large probes sticking into it. And you can realistically test something like a 50 microliter solution um, on an electrode like this, as opposed to the old way of doing electrochemical experiments, which was some mils, if not tens of mils of solution. So electrochemistry is a very nice um, science and very nice science because of the size of the instruments um, that we have. Now, this is a talk about electrochemistry. So we've said, you know, there's there's a subject called electrochemistry. It is economically very important in this world. Then there's a subtopic to it, which is electroanalytical chemistry, which is what we at Zimmer and Peacock. And then I want to kind of break into these three terms here that we have voltammetry, amperometry, and potentiometry. So we are going to do demos on each one of these techniques. And the first demo we're actually going to do is voltammetry. So in a bit, um, I haven't introduced him, but there's um, Andre is in our lab in Norway at the moment. So I'm, I'm um, near London in the UK. Andre is in Norway at one of our labs in Norway, and he's going to be doing a voltam voltammetric experiment for you. And then he'll be doing a potentiometric experiment later on, and then finally an amperometric experiment. But it's worth just saying, you know, a voltammetric experiment. Well, let's first of all, let's go to, and talk about voltammetry to start with. So at the moment, you can see um, what is what is voltammetry. Now, voltammetry, there's several techniques. There's cyclic voltammetry, which is the kind of grandfather of voltammetric techniques. Um, maybe hanging drop <laughs> polography may be the grandfather, actually, but... Cyclic voltammetry is a very common voltammetric technique. There's also things like differential pulse voltammetry, DPV. There's also square wave voltammetry. So there are lots of voltammetric techniques. But we will start with one, which is cyclic voltammetry. And in cyclic voltammetry, earlier on I talked about we have a working electrode in the center here. What we do is we apply a voltage to that working electrode and we keep on changing the voltage. We get to a new value of voltage, and then we change back to the original voltage. So let me try and illustrate what we mean by that. So in this illustration, the scientist starts with a voltage of 0.2 volts on that working electrode, and they go to 0.7 volts. What they're doing is they're sweeping the voltage, they call it. They're basically doing lots of tiny little steps step, 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 and they go from 0.2 volts to 0.7 volts. And they get a very distinct um, wave, which is you know, the current. So we have voltage along this axis and current. So initially, when they're doing this experiment, from 0.2 volts to 0.25 volts, there's no change. And then suddenly, as they get to about 0.275 volts, you can see there's a change. Effectively, not effectively, it is. The voltage is energy. You will only get a electrochemical reaction when you're applying enough energy. So in this case, initially there's not enough energy. And then when they reach a certain point, there is enough energy. 
and then they get they come to a peak and then there's a a, um, a decrease in the current again so it's almost like a peak we are going to discuss why it's this shape but in some ways you didn't have to know why it was this shape you could actually just accept that it was this shape but we will explain why cyclovoltammetry has this um, particular shape and in this example they're showing you that they're going from 0 0.05 um, micromolar to 10 micromolar and the peak height is increasing so electrochemistry or cyclovoltammetry it will give you peaks and those peaks will be proportional to concentration so now you have something that's proportional to concentration and that means you are sensing whether you are sensing it specifically or non so you could have lots of things that could give you a current so there's another conversation about specificity but it is sensing because it's giving you a peak height that is proportional to um to the concentration and i've got a couple of um animations running alongside this the animation at the top here is ferrocyanide um very ferrocyanide is a real classic in electrochemistry and what's hap what's happening in this animation is it starts off at about minus 500 millivolts we scan towards 500 millivolts and when we hit these critical voltages you then get the flow of current first in the positive direction and then in the negative direction positive negative positive negative and that's really reflecting the oxidation of a molecule and then its subsequent reduction we have another cartoon underneath this is the this is the um cyclovoltammetry of capsaicin so capsaicin is the molecule that makes chilies hot in this experiment the black line which is tracking now the um um the black line that's, that's tracking across at the moment um the, the, the scientist is doing it much slower but i just want you to notice something did you notice that the second experiment what they're doing they're doing two cycles first cycle second cycle the first time they did it the, this peak which was labeled three here wasn't there and then it appeared so we'll talk about that in detail later on but sometimes you can have cyclovoltammetry that's quite simple and then cyclovoltammetry that's quite complicated but that's okay because what that's telling you is that's a fingerprint for that particular molecule and you can clearly see the difference between ferricyanide which gives you you know a sort of an oxidation and then a reduction peak and then when you've been comparing it to capsaicin you get a scan that's very indicative on the first scan and then the second scan is actually quite different and that's a fingerprint for that molecule so we've talked we've said that electrochemistry is important we said that under electrochemistry there's electroanalytical chemistry under an electroanalytical chemistry you have techniques including cyclovoltammetry and I, I put this slide up because people are sometimes a little fearful of electrochemistry because they say, you know, what do these peaks mean? You know, in some ways you can dig down and find out what these peaks mean. But I would also sort of make you think about if anyone um, in the audience or online today is a chemist or a biologist, you're quite used to absorption spectroscopy. In absorption spectroscopy, you put a molecule in solution often you scan the wavelength and it will absorb light depending on the particular molecule so let's think about that now we are scanning the wavelength we're getting peaks due to the absorption of light and we have a spectrum i would actually say if you can understand absorption spectroscopy then you're really understanding cyclovoltammetry because in cyclovoltammetry rather than scanning wavelength we do scan voltage and rather than measuring absorption, we're measuring current. But really, if you can start to understand absorption spectroscopy, where the signal, by the way, the absorption is proportional to concentration, you're also on your way to understanding electrochemistry, where our peaks are also proportional to concentration. I want to draw an, another analogy with, um, um, with absorption spectroscopy as well. Often in absorption spectroscopy, you use a a little cell it's called a cuvette um, and into that cuvette you put your solution in electrochemistry we have chips these are 
This, this, this chip is a screen printed electrode system, but it's equivalent. You can do small volume analysis using absorption spectroscopy, and you can do small volume analysis using electrochemistry. So that the chip or the screen printed electrode is our equivalent to QVET. If you have, if you're thinking about developing an electrochemical assay, I would always ask you to kind of search or Google search for, is there an absorption technique for that analyte of interest? Because if there is, you can almost just translate it straight onto an electrochemical cell. Molecules that give you absorption spectrum will also give you electrochemical signal as well. Um, now, earlier on up, uh, in this slide here, we showed you ferricyanide. We showed you the cyclovoltammetry of ferricyanide, oxidation of ferricyanide, reduction of ferricyanide. What was actually happening in that experiment was in the solution, there is ferrocyanide. So there's ferrocyanide. And when we hit a certain voltage, the ferrocyanide starts to turn into a molecule called ferricyanide. Effectively, the ion center, which was plus two, became plus three. And those electrons flowed into the electrode and we measure it as current. And what happens is the more voltage we apply, the more current we get. But this peak height is proportional to concentration. So this, we will go higher and higher with this peak, the more molecules we have. But the point at which, um, there's a point at which we, 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 start, we start running out of molecules. We're adding so much voltage, there's no more molecules to apply electrons. And that actually then means that we start getting a depletion in um, signal. So this is why we get a no signal, because there's not enough energy. Now we're getting signal because we're applying energy, but it only comes to a certain point because after this point, there are no more molecules within the vicinity of that electrode to give us any more current. And we get what's called a diffusion barrier building up. So this current just changes. And then when, this, when the voltage is cycled in the opposite direction, we're now reducing the ferricyanide back to ferrocyanide. So we're now putting electrons into the molecule. So we get a negative current and then we return. So when we look at this cytovoltammetry of um, ferry ferrocyanide, we're looking at the oxidation of the molecule, and it peaks at the point at which, um, due to the limit, due to the concentration, there's no more molecules to keep up with this reaction. And so we now get a diffusion limitation, it's called. And then we, we scan backwards and we we're now reducing what we originally oxidized um, here. So that's explaining to you cytovoltammetry. This is the waveform that we do in cytovoltammetry. So in, I, I earlier on talked about absorption spectroscopy. In absorption spectroscopy, you start at one wavelength, you go to another wavelength. In cytovoltammetry, we start at one voltage, we go to another voltage, and we tend to actually go backwards again. So we go, Starting voltage, end voltage, back again. So that's the waveform. It's called a triangular waveform. And effectively, we go from this voltage, V1, to V2. And in between it, we get these peaks. And then when on our return, we get a new peak. So electrochemistry, subdivision of electrochemistry is electroanalytical chemistry. A subdivision of electroanalytical chemistry then is cyclovoltammetry. And cyclovoltammetry is the application of voltage to an electrode, molecules near the surface give up their electrons, and you get basically uh, oxidation peaks and reduction peaks, which are then proportional to the concentration of that molecule in the solution. And it's also worth saying um, that the peak position is also indicative of the molecule as well. So you can both the peak position tells you which molecule it is, and the peak height tells you how much there is in that solution. And so, you know, these are those cartoons again, and you can see that ferry, ferro, sorry, ferro ferry cyanide has a very different cytovoltammetry to capsaicin. So both of them have peak heights proportional to how much molecule is in solution, um, but the shapes or the 
the peaks that you can see are very different, so you have a fingerprint for both molecules. Um, if you're very interested, we're actually going to do a demo in a minute on capsaicin. Um, but if you're so interested, capsaicin is um, is a molecule that I'm sort of waving my mouth my mouse over here. Um, and what's happening is it's oxidizing. So when we first do the CV, the molecule is oxidized. That means there's an OH group here that becomes a carbonyl group here. So in this first peak, we oxidize it. Now, what we don't realize initially is as soon as we oxidize this molecule, it's undergoing hydrolysis. It's reacting with water. So by the time we scan back, we're not reducing the original capsaicin. We're now actually reducing what's called a quinone. So there was a reaction with water. It formed a quinone, and we're reducing the quinone to quinol. So now we have a new molecule, which is called quinol. And when we come back, we get the reoxidation of quinol back to quinone. So in fact, that's why the first scan looks different from the second scan in the capsaicin because it was a chemical reaction following the electrochemical oxidation. Now, you know, you can look at the scheme and, and, and try and, you know, follow it. In some ways, you can also accept that's a very distinctive fingerprint for capsaicin. So this is one of my last slides before we do a demo, but I want to just kind of say, um, you know, cyclovoltammetry, if you have no electrochemical activity, then you get a very flat line when you sweep the voltage. If you have a molecule like cyanide, you'll get a simple oxidation, a simple reduction. In this one, you have a molecule that's oxidized once and oxidizes twice, and then you reduce it once, and then you reduce it twice. So this molecule has sort of two oxidation states um, and this molecule says, I've oxidized that molecule, but it doesn't, re it doesn't then re-reduce. Re and things like acetaminophen and the sorbate are that kind of molecule. But you can see they're quite distinct. So there is a fingerprint for each type of molecule. What I'm going to do now is we're going to go to do a demo in the lab. So the lab is in Norway. Like I say, I'm based near London. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to come out of this mode slightly. I'll probably stop, stop presenting my screen. And then I'm going to do a sound check with um, Andre. So Andre is in um, is near Oslo in Norway. Andre, can you just do a quick sound check? Yes, yeah, sure. Can you hear me, Martin? Yeah, I can hear you fine. All right. So uh, so so far, Andre, we've talked for 28 minutes. Um, so we're already going over time. <laughs> um, but but, I, but you're going to do a, you're, you're going to do a demonstration of cyclovoltammetry in our lab. So if you just want to kind of give a, the guys a, a quick um, demonstration, that would be fantastic. That's correct. Okay. So uh, so my name is Andrea Fernandez. I'm I'm a research scientist here at Zimmer and Peacock. Uh, I I run uh, the labs here in Norway. And uh, what I'm going to show you here is basically um, a CV scan uh, in order to identify the capsaicin concentration in, for example, this uh, Tabasco sauce. So, um, so basically, the way we do this is we need uh, one of the ZP um, uh, sensors and uh, screen printed sensors, and we need an anapod, and um, and basically we need. Uh, one of the ZP chili buffer um, solutions for extraction, extracting the capsaicin from, from the extra Tabasco sauce. So what I did was I, I, I poured some Tabasco sauce into, a, into a, a, some sort of um, Petri dish, a weighing dish, and then I mix it in a proportion of one to four. Uh, I vortexed it and mixed it in this, in this uh, centrifuge tube. And now I, uh, I mixed it in, uh, using this vortex for two minutes. And now I'm going to insert one of our chili sensors, uh, ZP chili sensors, inside the anapod. So, uh, and so what I, I'm going to try just to do this and try to zoom in a bit more. So, 
what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pipette 50 microliters of this um, of this solution into onto the electrodes, so covering the working counter and the reference electrodes. I uh, so just covering those electrodes, and uh, and once I do that, I can then start running uh, the cyclic photometry. So the cyclic photometry, um, I'll show you in, in a second my PC settings. So. So this is done. Now the electrodes are completely covered. I'm just cover closing the lid. As you can see, now the electrodes are covered with the solution. So that's the habanero sauce with uh, basically with the chili buffer in order to extract the capsaicin. And I'm going here to the one thing that is to try to show you my PC. So, uh, so basically, all right. So, uh, so basically, what I'm going to do. These are the settings. I'm going to try to zoom in. Please, Martin, say if it's very bad the image. I'm just trying to not get too much. It's not. It's not, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a terrible image, and I think and, and I think you'll get you'll get the message across because so far you've you know you've shown how easy it was to set up the experiment. Now I can see your screen quite clearly. So just go ahead, Andre. Perfect. So I'm going to press play. On the, um, on the on the software and by pressing play now we can see that we are getting this is the first scan so we see the oxidation peak there we see a reduction peak there this is the second scan. So, so almost perfect, really. So, what I'll do now is, um, Andre, if you mute yourself, um, I'll do a quick, I'll do a quick summary, and I'll reshare my screen. So, let me. Um, so I'm going to reshare my screen with, uh, with you all. So um, hopefully that's coming through now. Uh, but what we wanted to do there was we did a lot of talking about cyclovoltametry and we did a lot of talking about screen printed electrodes and small instruments. And it's fair to say that Andre just sort of did that experiment in the space of about three minutes. Um, and it's that really that straightforward with electrochemistry. I think a lot of science is that people do, you know, it's months of setting up experiments and no results. Yeah, I mean, it can be like that in electrochemistry as well, but it also can also be quite rewarding that you can get quite a fast return on your efforts as well. So we have done a demonstration today of psychovoltometry. Um, we're going to come back to Andre um, in a bit, and we're going to, in a minute, in fact, and talk about tech. I'm just going to quick mute if one of you guys wants to mute yourself i heard just a bit of feedback there um so we're now going to go on to a different technique called um potentiometry and if you're not sure what potentiometry is then you probably use it an awful lot in your lab and it's you know it's obviously the classic ph probe or ph sensor in a lab is a is a classic example of a potentiometric sensor in a potentiometric sensor or the pH probe as an example, you obviously put the probe into a solution and, and you get the pH. In the background of that, of the way this probe is actually working, if you look very, if you were to pull apart the probe, you'd actually find there were two electrodes in there. In fact, you're working and a reference. The glass bulb that you're looking at in a pH probe is the working electrode. And inside that glass bulb, there's often a wire, and these days it's often a silver wire in a high concentration of um, something like um, maybe sodium or potassium chloride. So effectively, a pH 
sensor or is a good example of a potentiometric sensor. And if you pull them apart, you're going to find it's a two electrode system, a working electrode, which is often a pH sensitive glass bulb. And when you're looking at the metal inside it, that's actually often a silver wire sitting in chloride. And what's happening is the meter that you're using is actually measuring the voltage between those two electrodes and it's converting the voltage into pH. So, you know, whenever you use a, a pH meter, as you know, it asks you to do something like measure a pH of four, measure a pH of 10. And what it's doing is doing a two point calibration, obviously. And then when you measure your unknown, it's then saying, right, where does that voltage sit relative to those two, um, the voltage at port four and the voltage at 10, and then it's going to be able to calculate what the pH is. I, I put a, if you, behind a pH sensor and behind all potentiometric sensors, there's the Nernst equation. You're not meant to memorize this, you're just meant to remember that there's the Nernst equation. And the Nernst equation, and I like to put a picture of Nernst in here, because it teaches us that there's nothing new in this in this world. You know, we're reliant on you know, the last 200 years worth of science. And um, what the Nernst equation says is that the voltage that you measure on a potentiometric sensor is due to a sort of a, an intrinsic voltage of the cell and then times a whole series of constants and then importantly or sorry plus constants times the analyte of interest so in a ph sensor this log a here is ph um, the gas constant is also constant you either compensate for temperature or you keep the temperature constant in a potentiometric sensor because temperature is appearing there. N is a charge on the ion of interest. So in the case of um, a proton, N is one. In the case of calcium, N is two. And then Faraday is constant. But in the end, you can just, you can just remember this as it's the Nernst equation. The signal in the end is equal to an offset times the sensitivity or sensitivity times um, the log of the analyte of interest. So I'm going to cut, I'm going to break this down a little bit more. I said, you know, a pH sensor, if you pulled it apart, you'd find that it had a reference electrode in it and the meter is measuring the ion selective electrode versus that reference electrode. So we're measuring the voltage of a reference and we're measuring the um, the ion selective electrode versus that reference. It's, so we're basically measuring a voltage difference between two electrodes. Now if we look at one of our screen printed electrodes, then in fact what's happening is we make the working electrodes um, ion sensitive. And when I say ion sensitive, we make them for sodium and potassium and calcium and ammonium and nitrate and pH, possibly I'm missing one or two off there. So we make the working electrode ion sensitive, and then we have a reference electrode. So we're basically measuring the ion sensitive electrode versus the, the reference electrode. So what I'm gonna do again now is um, I'm gonna mute myself. Andre is gonna do a demonstration um, in his lab on a um, on a sodium sensor. So I'll mute, I'll stop presenting and let Andre do a quick um, introduction. So we're at 8.39 at the moment, Andre, but I, that's London time, but yeah, go ahead. All right, uh, Martin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, and see. Yeah. Uh, can I give you one question from Indonesia? Because probably yeah. it's related with your uh, topic now. Uh, first question from Sharif Hamdani from Indonesia. He has question, can biosensor be used to identify bacteria? If so, which method and electrode are good to use? Yeah, okay, so so I'm just gonna answer, I'm just, I'm just gonna um, answer that question very quickly. Um, if you want to do bacterial detection, um, I would Google um, optimizing a sandwich assay, Zimmer and Peacock. Um, 
So there's a, there's a page on our website called Optimizing. Um, in fact, I need to share my screen. So I'm just going to share my screen again. I'd rather want to share my screen. So the quick, the quick answer Martin. is I would ask you to, I would ask you to Google this, Google this term, because what you're going to find there is you're going to find that we have a web page about forming um, antibody layers on electrodes. Because effectively, I want to just say you would do it probably by identifying the antibody or a biological molecule specific to the to the bacteria of interest. Um, and so my my recommendation is to have a quick look at this page and when you want to do it we're going to recommend to you that you use a gold electrode um so we would we would probably recommend um because i we say gold electrodes because um people often use sam layers self assembly self-assembled monolayers so i would recommend to them a gold electrode um, one of our value sensors because they're their value. So there's something here called the 303. It's a gold um, electrode. You can therefore form the SAM layer on top of that. Um, Self-assembled monolayers allow you to then to then put an antibody onto that. So once you've got the antibody or the yeah the antibody to your bacteria, now you've built in the specificity. And if they read the page that I'm recommending, then it will teach them how to get signal out of that binding event and we talk about using ferricyanide in solution and when the bacteria binds it blocks the surface and then gives them a signal so i would ask them to look at that page but seems all right if i just flip back to to andre now he's waiting in the lab yeah 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 yes please right. i'll stop sharing okay, okay. andre and you, you can you hear me then perfect good all right. So, so what, uh, what I'm going to demonstrate here now is actually a potentiometric measurement. So, um, so we are actually uh, recording the potential. Um, this is these are ion sensitive electrodes. So they have a membrane that's sensitive to the to the ion of interest. And in this case, I'm doing the demonstration of a sodium sensor. So what we need is again um, a sodium sensor, one of Zimmer and Peacock's sodium sensors. And, um, and basically, on this setup, I'm actually using um, a beaker. So the reason for using the beaker is basically because with stereo. So I use the anapod. I have everything connected to the anapod. I use a connector, and I'm immersing the sensor in a 5 milliliter beaker containing a buffer. And I'm going to increment the sodium concentration with a calibration, a ZP calibration solution. And the reason for doing this is because, like that, I'm constantly supplying the, the electrodes with new ions, and you'll be able to see a very nice signal. So, um, so by doing, in order to do this, I have to pipette the calibration solution using a pipette and a pipette and a, and the calibration solution. I have to pipette uh, titrate different concentrations of sodium. And uh, so what I what I have here now I'm going to try to show my screen. So uh, where is it? There you go. Uh, it's a bit noisy signal because I have been uh, playing around with, with the setup. So I hope you all can see my signal in in the middle of the of the um, of the actual signal. Uh, this noise will be almost neglected. So, so what I'm doing now is I'm going, I'm uh, aspiring with the pipette, um, our calibration, sodium calibration solution. And now, as you can see, I am actually dispensing onto the beaker. And now you can actually see a step. Uh, this is a bit hard to see actually. Um, a step in concentration. No, no, so, we see it fine. Uh, we, we see, we see it fine, Andre. We see, we see that, we see that your sort of noisy baseline. And then you put the sodium in there, and then it, it, it jumped yeah. up. From it jumped 40. up. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. So, uh, so what I'm going to do now is, the, so this is, uh, I, and we did a step from 40 millimolar to 80 millimolar, so 40 millimolar step. What I'm going to do now is, I'm going to give another step and uh, and uh, and try to obtain. Uh, and try to change to 160 uh, millimolar. 
so the steering will also add some some noise to the to the test so when I pipetted now we saw another step so uh, according to nurse equation this is a, a logarithmic scale so uh, so now we did a 40 millimolar step and then an 80 millimolar step so, so what, I'm uh, do, what I'm going to do, Andre, so uh, because I, I'm looking at the time and we've got like 15 minutes. So I think course. what I want to say is thank you for that. We're going to come back to you in a minute then to do a final demonstration. Um, Perfect. So we're going we're gonna to plow on ahead. Haseem, if you want us to answer questions as we go, I'm happy to do it. Um, you know, so no, it, no, no real issues, but um, we're going to carry on with the presentation for now. And we'll come back to Andre in the lab um, shortly so see you in a few minutes andre right so we did a potentiometric um demonstration and so we showed you andre was pipetting in the sodium and he went from baseline to first plateau and then he put into more sodium he came to a second plateau so as he and he did mention the word logarithmic which he's saying you know um the scale, you know, is, is logarithmic. That, whereas psychovoltammetry, the signal is directly proportional to the concentration. In potentiometric, the signal is proportional to the log of concentration. Now, the final technique we're going to discuss today is um, amperometry. And amperometry is probably the most important um, electroanalytical technique in biosensing. Not scientifically is it the most important, but commercially it's the most important because most glucose sensors on the market um, are using um, amperometry as, as the technique in which they're analyzing it. So in cyclovoltammetry, we were saying, you know, when Andre did the cyclovoltammetry, he scanned the voltage up, he scanned the voltage down. In amperometry, we don't scan the voltage, we just keep it constant. So we have voltage versus time, and it's just a constant. So for example, if we were trying to make um, an oxygen sensor, we would just apply minus 625 millivolts. Um, now often, the signal has what we call a Cottrell response. So we have current, which diminishes with time. And that's not by accident, by the way, that current versus time that we're showing as a Cottrell response. When, you, when we were showing you cyclovoltammetry, we often showed you that there was a peak and then the current diminished. What's happening here, it's called a diffusional layer is building up. So it falls just like that. And actually, in amperometry, we often choose the voltage, which gives us the biggest signal, but the molecules are, all, are only diffusing in. So we end up, the, the current drops with time because there's what's called a diffusion limitation. So the current will fall. Um, and, but what, what in fact, the overall current is proportional to the concentration of the molecule. So it is a analytical technique. It's just unusual that it's not, you know, you don't get this nice steady signal. You actually get a signal that falls. And what you do is you integrate, for example, underneath the curve and that integration underneath the curve would be proportional to the original concentration. So amperometry is what we do is we often use psychic voltammetry to give us a spectrum of the molecule. And then we will choose one of the peak potentials then in order to do an amperometric experiment. Um, and as I say, amperometry is commercially one of the most useful techniques or most valuable techniques because it's used on a lot of glucose sensors. So we've talked about electrochemistry, but actually, you know, and we, we have touched on biosensors. The talk's actually about biosensors, but you have to do all that background to be able to make a biosensor. We've talked about at Zimmer Pigot, we use a lot of screen printed electrodes. Um, this is an example of a screen printed electrode where the electronics are also part of the package, let's say. So sensor and then electronics. And that's the beauty of electrochemistry. You can actually shrink all the electronics right down. Now at Zimmer Pigot, we do have an awful lot of electrochemical geometry, or sorry, a lot of geometries. 
um, and different metals. So earlier on, we were asked about how do we make a sensor for bacteria? The first thing you do if you want to make a sensor for bacteria is you probably end up using a gold electrode because a gold electrode will allow you to do self-assembled monolayers. If you came and said, I want to make a glucose sensor, then you, we would probably suggest that you use a platinum electrode because glucose sensors often work on what's called a peroxidase molecule. Glucose reacts with the enzyme and produces hydrogen peroxide, and platinum is a good surface for detecting um, hydrogen peroxide. If you were trying to do um, a sensor for something like a um, for something like a polyaromatic hydrocarbon, you could probably use platinum, gold, or carbon. But carbon would also be quite good for things like polyaromatic hydrocarbons, because um, things that are um, have lots of carbon molecules in them, if you want to oxidize them or reduce them, then carbon as a surface for that is not bad. So we have lots of geometries depending on the application, and lots of metal types depending on the kind of metal types depending on the kind of assay that you want to run. And the nice thing about this kind of technology is, you know, we these screen prints and electrodes, even at, even when we're only selling packs of two hundred, we're selling them at ninety nine cents each. So a pack of two hundred is is one hundred ninety eight euros, but individually they're quite um, they're quite low cost. Um, what's very big at the moment in um, biosensing is actually wearables. Everyone wants to do. Uh, Continuous glucose monitoring in diabetics, CGM, that's very big at the moment. Lactate monitoring in athletes, that's very, um, in, people are very interested in that at the moment. Hydration monitoring. Um, and the nice thing about electrochemistry is, you know, you can have your sensor and electronics all in a very small package. And this little silver square here is actually the battery. So um, thin film, but, oh, sorry, thin film, but thin batteries married with electronics and integrated biosensors gives you a very nice wearable type platform. Um, we have already done a demonstration on pH sensing. So I can see some questions out there about you know, pH sensors. If you ever were to see the real signal from a pH meter, what you would find is here we've gone pH 2, pH 3, pH 4, pH 5, pH 6, pH 7, pH 8, pH 9. So when you're calibrating a pH sensor, what you're effectively doing is you're, it, this, the, the meter says, what's the pH of the solution? You say pH 4. So you put the pH 4 in there and it measures the voltage. It says, oh, that voltage is 175 millivolts. Then it says, put in another solution. So you put in another solution and it's pH 9. So now it goes, okay, that's a pH 9. I've got naught millivolts. So now it's able to do what's a two-point calibration. Um, because it knows the pH and voltage up, up here, and it knows the pH and voltage down here. So when you put your unknown in there, it measures the voltage, compares it to the other two known points, and then it's able to calibrate or calculate the pH of the solution. I did see a question on, on YouTube, why do we use buffers so much? And obviously we use buffers a lot because we don't want pH to be a variable in our assay. So for example, a lot of people are interested in glucose measurements. Um, glucose measurements um, use an enzyme called glucose oxidase. Glucose oxidase is pH sensitive. It becomes, it has its highest activity at pH 5, whereas blood, for example, has pH 7. So you've got to buffer this system. Otherwise, you can have a enzyme in some sort of unknown pH between 5 and 7. And if that's going on, then you'll have a different signal due to the pH and it's not specific to the glucose. So we buffer because often pH can be a, a source of variation in an assay. And we don't want that source of variation. So we buffer it to make sure that pH is not a variable. The things that we try to control in biosensing is temperature and pH, you know, is, is, is at least two of the variables that we try to control. I'm going a bit faster because um, We've been speaking for 55 minutes, so I apologize for that. And maybe um, if there's big interest, we can do a sort of follow-on um, webinar around this subject. So I realize it's bigger than 60 minutes worth. So I'm going to go fast, and I apologize for that. But let's go faster. Application of biosensors. You can do 
Five senses are oxygen, potassium, lactate, ammonium, nitric oxide, pH, hydrogen peroxide, glucose, chili, which Andre was talking about, calcium, conductivity, so you can do things like salinity, how salty is the water, sodium, you can do nitrate, phosphate, we're doing a sensor for garlic, you can also do sensors for things like sulfite, uric acid is very interesting to people, we have chloride, and then some people are interested in the redox state of molecules. So we have a sensor called for oxidation reduction potential, TAS and FRAP, total antioxidative status and ferric reducing, I want to say FRAP, which is some sort of ferric reducing ability of plasma, but um, ferric reducing ability of plasma, yes, FRAP. Um, how do you turn a bio, how do you turn a screen printed electrode into a biosensor? This is the next slide I want to touch upon. You take your working electrode, for example, you um, immobilize um, enzymes upon that surface or antibodies or some sort of recognition molecule. And at least in this in this example of glucose, you often put what's called a barrier layer on top. You want to sort of present pre prevent, you want to protect the enzymes from solution. So the simplest sensor that most people make is, if you, you know, is, is a glucose sensor. And a glucose sensor, you need an electrode onto which you would deposit a solution of glucose oxidase. And on top of there, then you would put a barrier layer. And it's, it's can be literally that simple into, in order to make a biosensor. Functionalization. So if you're trying to make pH, a pH sensor, the classic metal is um, iridium oxide. If you're trying to make a potassium, sodium, or ammonium sensor, there is a molecule out there called ionophores. So the ionophores will help you with those sensing. If you're trying to do a glucose, lactate, alcohol sensor, maybe uric acid sensor, they all have oxidase enzymes. So that's how you would make those types of sensors. And then the, for the how to make sensors for proteins and bacteria, then I would say it was antibody-based sensors. The nice thing about electrochemistry is we've shown that you know, these sensors can be very small, but you can actually also sort of screen print sensors onto clothes and have, you know, like body wearable sensors. So that's the beauty of this kind of science. Um, where is biosensor going? Where, where are biosensors going? So, um, there's a term out there that's used a lot, many of you will have heard of it, called point of care. So traditionally, um, people would do the analysis of blood in big centralized laboratories. But of course, if you're a diabetic, that's no good. You can't send your blood to the laboratory every time. You need to be testing your blood, you know, daily. So rather than doing lab testing, people now do point of care testing. And where this really is going is, at Zimmer and we actually think that senses could even be permanently on the skin. And if you're looking for inspiration around where sensing could go, I would recommend um, looking up a guy called um, Joseph Wang at University College San Diego. So, you know, his kind of concepts are about biosensing becoming very intrinsic to the skin. So we're moving from the lab, point of care, wearables, and maybe the, the near future is actually sensors that are you know, either on the skin or actually in the clothing itself. Um, I'm going quicker now, just out of interest, the history of biosensors. There's nothing new about biosensors. This is Leyland Clark in the 1950s. He made the world's first recognized biosensor and he happened to make an oxygen sensor. Um, so um, where did biosensors start? They started with a guy called Leyland Clark and the first sensor he made was an oxygen sensor. And in an oxygen sensor, the beautiful thing about oxygen is if you apply a voltage of something like minus 625 millivolts, then the oxygen can be directly detected. So in this example, we have a oxygenated solution. So there's oxygen in the solution. There's a drop of oxygen on the sensor. And then we so there's nothing new about biosensors. This is a gentleman called um, Leyland Clark. He invented the first biosensor in the 1950s. Um, and um, the first biosensor he developed was an oxygen sensor. The nice thing about oxygen sensors is um, 
the voltage at you can basically detect oxygen directly if you apply a voltage of something like minus 625 millivolts so here he was showing that oxygen in solution can be reduced to water and the signal you get is proportional to the oxygen so there's nothing really new about um, biosensors this is um, some data that we've collected where we have an oxygenated solution and we have a current of minus four microamps and then we deoxygenate it and the signal changes quite rapidly. Um, now amperometry is commercially used an awful lot as I say in glucose sensing. The beautiful thing about glucose sensors um, and glucose strips is that they're easy to manufacture, they're low cost, they run well under ambient light. So it's really important that um, you know that in fact you know you can have a drop of blood you can put it on a sensor this whole thing can be done under light and um, it won't interfere with the signal there's very limited sample preparation you know you can just put a drop of blood on there and get a, uh, get, get a signal um, the first sensors the first glucose sensors were called a generation one sensor and what a generation one sensor means is that you've got glucose that reacts with the glucose oxidase and oxygen is reduced to hydrogen peroxide. So it's hydrogen peroxide that's actually de detected. So generation one sensors use glucose oxidase and the product of the reaction was actually hydrogen peroxide. And that's really what we're detecting in generation one sensors. Um, at Zimmer and Peacock, we make a glucose sensor. Uh, we make generation one and what's called also generation two. So we have a current that is proportional to glucose concentration. Um, and here we have zero millimolar, five, 10, 15, and 20. So the signal is increasing as we increase the glucose. The experimental setup here is actually um, a sensor sitting in a solution and we're actually pipetting in um, glucose solutions. The history of the glucose sensor goes back um, sort of uh, 15 BC um, and, you know, to, to the modern times. But, you know, there's... The glucose meters that we have today are probably something like a fifth generation product that, you know, people don't choose electrochemistry because they think it's like an amazingly cool science. They choose electrochemistry to make glucose sensors because it actually makes is a very robust science. The first glucose sensors were actually um, optically based. You know, so they were basically using sort of light absorption as their source of signal. And um, it's only when people realize how Electrochemistry allows you to, to work in whole blood. You don't have to dilute the blood. The fact that blood is opaque isn't a problem for electrochemistry. So electrochemical glucose sensing really only came about because it gave the application so many advantages. It wasn't because people wanted electrochemistry. They certainly didn't. So we, um, if you want to see a glucose sensor demo, then actually the, um, Zimmer Peacock has, some, um, has a knowledge base on our website where you can actually watch um, that sort of, that kind of demonstration. So maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll just quickly show you where um, that is. So if you go to Zimmer um, Peacock and you go Knowledge Base and you go Application Zone, you can see Andre, for example, doing a glucose um, demo here. Um, so. Uh, so this is Andre in, in one of our labs in Norway. Um, in the background, he has something called the Anapot. He's holding one of our glucose um, sensors here. He's discussing the sensor here. He's putting it into the meter. In a minute, he's going to put on some solution. So that's what he's doing here. He's putting on solution. And now he's going to start his experiment in a minute. He's telling you. You know, in this particular sensor, you probably need to apply a voltage of something like 650 millivolts. He's going to run that experiment. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's going to start the experiment in a minute. So here he goes. He's starting the experiment. The signal is going to form basically what we call a baseline. So what he's going to do now is he's going to take another solution and now he's going to add some glucose in. So he's formed a baseline in this experiment and now he is going to add in glucose. Yeah. 
there he goes. And what you'll notice in the screen behind him is that the signal will suddenly jump up in a minute. Bang, there you go. Glucose jumped up. So basically the enzyme has seen the um, glucose. It started generating hydrogen peroxide. Andre's applying a voltage of 650 millivolts, so that's now giving him the signal. So I will take that off, go back to the presentation, which is here. Just to say lactate sensor is exactly like a glucose sensor, except rather than using um, glucose oxidase, we're using lactate oxidase. So lactate um, reacts with the enzyme um, to form um, pyruvate and um, oxygen is generates hydroperoxide. So a glucose sensor is reacting like a, sorry, a lactate sensor reacts like a glucose sensor. Microfluidics is really important for um, biosensors. Um, there's another term out there called in vitro diagnostics, IVD. People talk about this all the time, in vitro diagnostics. In vitro diagnostics for me, obviously, is the detection of um, samples that are relevant to human health. And within that sample is an analyte for um, linked to some sort of health status. But what I want to say is in vitro diagnostics is really the marriage between um, biosensors and microfluidics. So microfluidics is um, really important to biosensing. And it's probably worth, there's a few YouTube videos um, that we have on our Zimmer Pigot website um, showing you microfluidics. So I will um, just navigate them on our website. So if I go products, uh, probably capillary fill sensors. There's a picture of a capillary fill sensor here. There's a little video here. And you can see here that we bring the sample in and it wicks in. So that's kind of, that's a really good way of bringing a sample to a sensor. I want to just show you another type of um, microfluidic device. So if you Google um, um, credit card sensor Zimmer and Peacock, you'll come to this page. Um, and there's a little video here about, it's a credit card size microfluidic. Here we've got several sensors lined up in a row. Um, we pipette on the sample. Now these black lines are actually microfluidic channels. And what you're going to notice is the shortest channel, which is this one here, filled up first. The next channel filled up, the next channel filled up, the next channel filled up, and then the two longer channels filled up are over here. So microfluidics is very important to anyone thinking or making um, biosensors. So I just wanted to touch on microfluidics. And then I wanted to kind of do a summary. Look, you know, what did we talk about today? We talked about electrochemistry. We talked about electrochemical biosensors, voltmetric sensors, potentiometric sensors, which pH and glucose, sorry, pH is a good example of potentiometric sensors, and glucose is a good example of amperometric sensors. Microfluidics is actually important to with biosensors because when you have microfluidics plus electrochemical sensor, you have IVD in vitro diagnostics. What we haven't spoken about today is um, EIS, Electrochemical Impedance Spectroscopy. So we can do an entire webinar on the, just on that topic alone. So in summary, biosensors allow you to, you know, really get involved with human health, be it analytes on the breath, be it continuous glucose monitoring and, um, in diabetic patients, and maybe even being um, monitoring of analytes in athletes. Okay, so... Thank you very much. If you have any questions regarding biosensors, contract development, contract manufacturing, then please um, reach out to us at um, ZP. All right. Thanks very much.